interpretation program yeah. uh, here at the, the first. Okay. Um, our speakers have asked for a very brief introduction, and that's what they're going to get. Uh, we're very happy to have our guest tonight, Amber Steed, who is with the fisheries biologist for Region 1 of Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Parks in Kalispell, and Tom Dixon, who is the editor of Mount Montana Outdoors. They claimed that they wrote this magazine article and it just happened to make a handy talk. I personally think they wrote this that article just so they could talk here. <laughs> <laughs> the talk came first the second. But, um, anyway, they were very uh, gracious and brought magazines for everybody. So I would be sure to pick one of those up on your way out and then I will turn it over to our speakers. Thank you for being here. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you all for coming to hear what Tom and I have to share about what we've learned through writing this article about Montanans' values over the past century or so and how that's reflected in fisheries management through that time. And I think you'll find that a lot of what we'll share um, reflects a lot of changes that have occurred through that time, but there's a lot of constants, too, that themes that carry through to today. So. Um, and some terms that we'll be using uh, during the talk include just the word fishery. And that's not always clear what that means. And when I say the word fishery, maybe some of you could tell me what comes to mind, even if I know some of you are experts on it. But um, what are some words that come to mind when I say fishery? Rivers. Rivers. Where fish live. Where fish live. Hatcheries. Hatcheries. That's a big theme with what we'll cover today. Yeah, so those are all big components of fisheries. And what I learned when I was in grad school about just a basic definition is it's comprised of three things. One, the fish, probably most obviously, but also the people that inter interact with fish. So whether that's anglers, primarily usually, but any kind of interaction or impact that fish can have or people can have on fish. And then, as you mentioned, rivers, or the place that fish live. So whether that's rivers or lakes or streams, it's the habitat. So those three things make up a fishery. And another term that often gets used is management, which is pretty broad and can have a lot of different definitions. But in this context, it refers to simply how we're stewarding the resource um, to preserve it and have sustainable use for now and into the future. And so those two things together we'll be touching on a lot. So, so for exa exa example, mm -hmm. like on the Missouri River, if we talk about the Missouri River's fishery around Craig or below Holter Reservoir, that fishery would, would, um, com would be composed of the, the, the fish population, which is mainly rainbow trout, mountain whitefish, and brown trout and some um, eel pout and some other species, and then the anglers who are fishing there mostly, and then the, that environment around the Missouri River. So we talk about the Missouri River fisher, fishery or the Clark Fork fishery or the Bighorn fishery or the Fort Peck fishery. That's what we're talking about. We talk about the Montana's fisheries. It's sort of all of those components. So we're just going to walk through some periods in the past century or so that are kind of clumped into distinct themes um, and share with you what's changed and what's remained mostly the same. So before uh, Europeans arrived in this part of North America, the, the, the fisheries were, were pretty much pristine and free of any sort of human damage or effect. I mean, they were we had mostly in, in western Montana, we had a West Slope cutthroat trout, mountain whitefish, a bull trout, and um, the eastern Montana, uh, sauger, um, channel catfish, um, uh, pallid sturgeon, and shovelnose sturgeon. And those, those fisheries just sort of existed. They didn't really change from century to century. There was certainly human use at the time. Um, uh, Native Americans were using those fish. They were harvesting, especially during the spawning season, they were harvesting uh, sturgeon, uh, pallid sturgeon and lake sturgeon, even a little white sturgeon in the spring when those fish were spawning, and then um, harvesting bull trout in the fall when bull trout um, spawned, uh, using uh, 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 baskets to make weirs, uh, rock 
rock weirs, and also with spearing. But there was really no, they were really no, having no effect on those fish populations, so there was really no need for management at the time, and there was no, no management. But that was, was, was soon to change. And so early in Montana statehood, um, the term Montanan was pretty new. And at that time, settlers were primarily interested in making a living, surviving on the landscape, but um, also in using the bountiful resources that were available at the time as, in as many ways as possible. So that included mining and logging and hunting and fishing. And at that time, fishing included things like you know, rod and reel, but also uh, dynamite, also known as giant powder, uh, poison, and seines, which are kind of a curtain of net that you can put into a stream or a river to try to collect everything that's there. And so the, the theme was get as much as possible and don't look back, basically. Um, and, and through this time, the fisheries management was fairly rudimentary but it really began with the creation of the Board of Fish and Game Commissioners in 1895. And soon after, they appointed uh, W.F. Scott as the first state's game warden and began writing some uh, regulations. And one of those first ones was banning the use of TNT or giant powder <laughs> and in using that to capture, stun, or kill fish. And some others that followed include requiring holding a fishing license and registering all fish ponds with the Board of Fish and Game Commissioners. Um, some others also, let's see, um, I don't want to forget some important ones, including fish screens on ditches um, so you could prevent fish from getting stranded in fields because at this time a lot of dams and irrigation were going in to just grow food but that really blocked fish movement and at times stranded them in these fields. And so residents of Montana were starting to observe the impacts of this heavy resource extraction and wanted to see some, some stemming of the impacts. Um, maybe didn't want to slow down necessarily that resource extraction, but didn't want to see a loss of and, their resources. And think of that for a second, just how interesting that is. Amber's talking about the late 1800s. I mean, so already, Montanans, you know, it's, it's barely a state, but already Montanans are starting to pay attention to the effects of development, of, of resource extraction on their rivers. So they're already valuing their rivers enough to say, hey, we, we can't be just dumping s sawdust directly from a sawmill into um, the, the Blackfoot River. We can't do that. We have to, we have to put screens in, in front of uh, irrigation ditches because the fish are just ending up, you know, being um, out on uh, alfalfa fields in the summer. So it's a it's a it's a beginning of kind of an environmental awareness you know, that early late late eighteen hundreds. Yeah, and at the same time, that was the seeds of the hatchery and stocking era that Tom will touch on more in a minute were really planted as people started to see the loss of these previously r abundant wildlife on the landscape in bison and elk and beaver, and fish were not an exception to that. And, uh, but the challenge in enforcing some of these new regulations was, was pretty huge. And so soon after W.F. Scott, our first game warden, was appointed, he then appointed eight deputies across the state to help enforce those laws. And they had a pretty modest salary and a big uh, to-do list. And, um, they were charged with starting to enforce some of these new laws enacted. Um, but but the, uh, the historian that was just, the, her quote oh, was sorry. just up there. That's okay. Um, Joan Louise Brownell really pointed out in observing this time that it was very difficult to enforce these laws, um, not because of just the scale of the state, but also the motivation of... Um, the legislature and others and local municipalities and actually enforcing them. So there was that challenge still to face. So the, the next era that, that uh, began in the early 1900s after that sort of early go-go um, um, exploitation era was the stocking era. And that lasted from the early 1900s really through for rivers through the mid-1970s and then continues on today. Montana continues to stock reservoirs and mountain lakes. Um, but the river stocking was 
through the early 1900s to about the mid-1970s. And what was going on in this early period is Montanans were sort of, I mean, I mentioned that there were some, some rudimentary environmental regulations, but they were the most basic. In the 1920s and 1930s, Montanans were still using rivers and streams as open sewers for communities. They were still done, there were still mining tailings was going into water. Um, the hillsides were being clear cut. And so there was silt washing into streams that was suffocating uh, aquatic insects that trout need to eat and, and uh, um, covering fish eggs so the spawning wasn't occurring or the reproduction wasn't occurring. And so they were looking around and they're sort of seeing that there weren't as many fish as there had been 10 or 20, 30 years ago. And so, but we're still in the boom era. I mean, we're still building Montana. We're still trying to create massive economic development. And so the solution wasn't to curtail the development, the, the solution had to be something else. And in that era, for people, the solution was often to grow things. And so you needed crops, you grow crops. You need more trees, you grow, grow more trees. And you need more fish, you grow more fish. And so in the early 1900s, the whole idea of raising fish was sort of a new development and a new science. It's very complicated to like take eggs from wild fish and mix them with the milt of male fish and then incubate them in a building and hold them in raceways. I mean, that, you know, in the early years, all those fish would just die. And so they had to sort of develop that. And so Montanans latched onto that that was going on in other parts of the country. And they thought, this is what we got to do. We got to raise trout in Montana and put those in the street, in the streams and rivers. So the first um, federal hatchery was in, in 1896. That was in Bozeman. That hatchery is still just outside of Bozeman, north of, north of Bozeman. The first state hatchery was the Anaconda Fish Hatchery that's still in operation. That was in 1909. And the first fish that we brought in to supplement the, f the existing fisheries that were already here and the existing trout in Montana were the West Low Cutthroat Trout, the Yellowstone Cutthroat Trout, and the Red Band Trout, the Red Band Trout up in the very northwestern part of the state. And that's a type of rainbow trout. But the first trout we brought in for propagation were rainbow trout from California. California, the McLeod rainbow trout that were being reared in the McLeod hatchery in California. It was part of the McLeod watershed. And then brown trout that came originally from, from Europe, from Germany, and then were brought over to Washington, D.C. And then the U.S. Fish Commission sent trains across the United States with these brown trout. We got brown trout from Washington, D.C., and then brook trout we got from eastern states. And brook trout were native as far west as southwestern uh, Minnesota. And so all these fish came in, and we started to raise them in Montana and putting them in our streams and rivers. And it was go-go stocking in the early years. I mean, by 1933, there were 22 state and, and federal fish hatcheries in Montana, dozens of private hatcheries. I mean, every sportsman's club in the state got a hatchery going, and, and the Montana Fish and Game Department, as it was known at the time, they were like, have at it, guys. It was all guys, and have at it, guys. Put those fish everywhere you can. And so people were raising fish and rearing fish and stocking fish, and it was crazy. But as, as William Albert, who used to be the fisheries chief, um, wrote in his History of Montana's Fisheries, you know, basically, no, no one is really paying attention to, to the ramifications of any of that. I mean, did the, did the stream or river need fish? Who cares? They put fish in there. Were those fish competing with other fish and causing problems? I don't know. Let's just put fish in there. So there was really no sort of looking at the regard of that. And that was fine. I mean, he was working at the time. And... Um, but what that was doing, these are a couple of interesting photos. One, these are some crates carrying live fish that were being trucked up into the backcountry. And this is the Thamalis. This is the uh, rail car that was owned by the state that was shipping from the hatcheries, shipping fish all over the state in this one rail car. Thamalis is, uh, I think that's, that's part of the scientific name of the Arctic grayling. Is that right? Is that some people know that? There's a little fun fact about that, too, because I went to, when I was in grad school, I worked on Arctic grayling, and that... That name there uh, is supposedly tied to someone thought that their flesh smelled like thyme, and so that got into their scientific name. Oh, is that right? Oh, so it's thyme Alice. <laughs> thyme Alice. <laughs> However you want. I've heard it said many oh. different ways. So. Good correction on my pronunciation well, in a real yeah. subtle way. And <laughs> she gets to point out that she's got a master's degree too. So yes. really, good work. Just in one area. <laughs> so anyway, the 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 so um. One of the things that was happening, though, is 
is anglers were starting to forget that there were fish in those rivers in the first place. And they started to sort of associate fish with hatcheries. When they caught a fish, they just assumed it was because the hatchery truck had pulled in there a few days later. And in a lot of cases, that was actually what was going on. The other thing that was going on at the same time, now we're getting in the 40s and 50s, and the, the national press was starting to get interested in Montana's fisheries. So uh, Ted Trueblood, uh, Joe Brooks, Charles Brooks, some of the famous writers for Field and Stream Sports, the Field and Outdoor Life, were writing about Montana and other streams in, uh, in other states in the West, but mainly about Montana. So more and more people were coming to Montana and were really enjoying the fishing that was here that was based largely on stocking. So stocking was still perpetuating, you know, the, the sort of the first wave of national recognition of fishing in Montana. So all of this enthusiasm and energy building up for the first half of the 1900s um, towards stocking and uh, providing these opportunities for, for anglers um, continued, but there was a growing interest, especially following World War II when science became to be much more prevalent in society in all these different areas and fisheries management was no exception. There was a growing interest in learning, well, what are the impacts of this stocking and mainly how can we make the most of our efforts? How can we maximize our stocking and uh, see how well those stocked fish are surviving, for example? And so um, the biology section of the fisheries division was created in the late 40s to address that. And Charles Finisi, which may or may not be the pronunciation of his name, but that's what I'm going with. Is that true, Larry? <laughs> Fennessy. Okay. thank you. Now I know. Uh, was hired as the first fisheries biologist, charged with basically addressing that question and learning more about our fishery resources that we had. And his efforts were supported by the passage in 1950 of the federal Dingle Johnson Act, which was a tax on fishing gear that um, brought money into states for fish conservation and uh, actions like Charles was uh, charged with carrying out. And also um, supporting that was the recent program that started up at Montana State University uh, in fisheries management, producing a lot of new biologists and volunteers to help conduct these studies. And so they set about learning more about our resources and this first stream studies uh, began. And for example, um, crews surveyed anglers about their creel. It's a real common tool used in fisheries management is talk to anglers and what are you catching? Uh, how big are those fish? What are catch rates like? That was a um, tool used right away. And surveys were also conducted on Prickly Pear Creek, for example. And there was a three-year study that was started in 1949 to learn just how the stream functioned. Basic questions that hadn't really been addressed here before. So, for example, fish densities and growth rates using things like this, this picture of a scale here. It's kind of like looking at tree rings. You can get at fish growth and age that way. And um, looking at fish habitat, what are the stream flows and temperatures through time? What is the age structure, food availability? All these different questions. How, how are anglers impacting the stream? And of course, the question of how are our stocked fish doing relative to the wild counterparts. And so the results of these early surveys went um, right back into management, informing the stocking efforts and helped uh, create a regulation uh, or a policy within a department, for example, in 1953 that said, we'll only stock cutthroat and Arctic grayling and rainbow in, uh, in particular water bodies, then they have to be six inches long or more. Um, because we know that those fish do better when they're planted. They survive better than the smaller fish. Brown trout were no longer uh, stocked by and large because they found that they could do just fine on their own without being supplemented. So on to the, the next slide here. Um, oh, sorry, back to the last one. And so at this time, there was also a lot of road building going on across the US. The Federal Highway Commission was very busy and uh, Montana was no exception. And there was some that were observing that the impacts of that road building uh, may s directly translate into fisheries. And um, so there was an interest in studying that as well. And 
So biologists went out and looked at stream habitat, the fish habitat, and how that was being impacted. And so a result of that was there were 13 studies done across western and central Montana looking at streams, trout streams, before and after highway construction. And they found there were some major impacts and that in some streams up to 75% of fish uh, reduction in fish numbers uh, was observed. And so there was uh, this big impetus from, from all of the information collected from those studies that then led to the 1963 Stream Protection Act, um, which was the first bill of its kind, and it was a state piece of legislation, but the first of its kind um, in the nation that started here. And I know Tom's written about it and is well-versed in it, and so um, that had big implement, Im implications on protecting our aquatic resources in the state. And the department at the time recognized uh, the impacts of all this road building and observing that they're doing some potentially irreparable damage and certainly there's an impact that we need to stem. And so so this, this, this period is, is, is a fascinating per period in, in Montana's history. So here's 1955, you know, already the department is saying, you know, already they're seeing that these roads are affecting our trout fisheries. And one of the biggest issues at the time, and, and continues today, is the issue of what's called channelization. And I don't have a, a, a diagram of it, but I'll explain how it is. You know, would, when you're, when you're going to put a road in, the best place to put a road in office is in a river valley. You know, because then you don't have to go up and over mountain ranges. The valley has already been carved out of the mountain. And so, but a river valley, and I'm just going to use... Don't even pay attention to this photo. But a river valley, you know, snakes along like this as it goes along. And so if you're going to put a road in that valley, you know, the road, if it follows the stream, would have to go like this and this and this and this. Well, to an engineer, that is really <laughs> not a, a cost-effective and a smart way to build a road. And, 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 that's, and that's fine. I mean, I would understand. My dad's an engineer, so you know, I understand that. So with an engineer, the smartest way to build a road would just be straight through the valley like this. But if you do that with the, the stream going like this, you have to either do two things. One, one of two things. One, you have to build a bunch of bridges to go over the stream, like you see in a little, little prickly pear as you're going on your way to Craig, or it even, but more, that, those are expensive and hard to do, but even better was you just take the stream and you just straighten the stream out. And now the stream runs parallel to your road. Problem solved for the road, okay. <laughs> but not for the stream, because a straight stream, what it loses, all of those meanders, all those twists and turns are places where fish live. And so all of that undulation creates these, some shallow areas where they can spawn and some deep holes where they can hide in the winter and hide from herons and mink and things like that. And so you need all of those meanders for a fish population to survive. So those, those biologists that Amber was talking about who were studying the road development, they were finding out when you channelize these streams, that's why some of those streams were losing up to 75% of their, of their trout. So what was happening at this time? So it's just, it's, what's amazing is that Montanans were kind of going along through the 30s and 40s and 50s. They had their development going on, and they had their fisheries going on, and they're stocking those fisheries, and everything was kind of moving along okay. But starting in about the late 50s and 60s, with this research that was done by these fisheries biologists, people like this, like Dick Fitzett, they were saying, they were saying, look, there's some problems out there, and we've got some conflicts between development and our fisheries. And so the whole <clears throat> the theme of this presentation is how fisheries management is reflecting the values of Montanans. I mean, fit, people, like, people like Amber don't just go out on her own and decide what to do. She's doing fisheries management you know, based on the needs and desires by Montanans, reflected often through legislation. But sometimes, sometimes Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Park is, it, Parks isn't just following what the public wants. Sometimes it's out ahead, finding out, scientists are finding out what's going on out there and coming back and reporting to people like you and saying, hey, these, this road construction that's going on, this is a problem. This is a problem. Now, you have to decide what you want to do about it. Now, the public could say, we don't care if it's a problem. We want roads and we want them as cheap as possible. But Montana said, no, we want roads 
but we we want to do something about it. We want to make sure that those roads are built in ways that protect the fish habitat that we value too. And so th this is a way, and this happens a lot in natural resources management. That's why we have agencies like ours. We have agencies like ours because people like you, you don't have expertise in elk. You don't have expertise in bull trout. You don't, you don't know what grayling need for spawning. So you hire people like Amber to go get a master's degree and go out there and figure out what's going on and then report back to you and say, this is what we need to protect grayling. And this is what we need to make sure that we're going to have bull trout 100 years from now. And this is what we need for elk and wolverines and things like that. So there's this constant back and forth between the biologists out in the field, you know, forging you know, new territory and reporting back to the public, and then the public, often through the legislature, coming back to the agency and saying, this is what you need to do. So new perspective. So, so, so things are kind of changing in Montana. Um, uh, Amber talked about the, the Stream Protection Act of 1963, which, is, which was huge in Montana. Um, there was also, um, you know, the, Montana, 1955, had one of the first state pollution control acts of any state in the country. 1972, we, we, we uh, enact a, a, a constitution in the state that promises a clean and healthful environment. I mean, those of you who were around during the environmental movement in the, in the early 70s, Montana was at the epicenter of that in so many ways. And so all of this is going on, and these fisheries biologists are kind of in the center of that. I mean, in the 1970s, there was a move, there was a move to dam the Paradise Valley, to dam the Yellowstone River at Allenspur, which is just north of Livingston. That would have inundated the entire, for 35 miles, the entire Paradise Valley. I mean, it was this close to happening. It was because of biologists who were out doing the work and they were saying, these are the ramifications if we would have this kind of damming. These are the problems it would cause that allowed the state to decide not to do that. So a number of things, the Endangered Species Act of 1973, and then this revolutionary thing. I talked about this guy, Dick Vincent, biologist out of Bozeman, Montana. Quiet, unassuming, brilliant, brilliant guy. He and a couple other biologists at the time, this is the early 70s, they were wondering if maybe stocking rivers is not all it's cracked up to be. You know, stocking was thought, you had your wild populations and you had your stock populations. You just put the stock fish in with the wild fish, two plus two equals four. You got twice as many fish. Vincent was thinking, no, maybe two plus two is equal to three, or maybe two plus two is equal to one. Now, how could that be? He had this hunch. So he set up this study on the Madison River and at Varney Bridge, the Varney Bridge section, which is upstream of Varney Bridge, and Odell Creek, which is a feeder creek that runs in at Ennis. And they did this study and they found, they proved that stocking hatchery fish on top of wild fish in rivers actually reduces the total number of fish. The, the wild fish get so disoriented by the stock fish, they freak out and they're easy to catch and the, and the, and the, and the predators can get them easier. And the stock fish, they're easily caught anyway because they're, they're, they're hatchery fish and they don't have any wild savvy. And so starting in the mid-70s, the department started to not stock rivers and streams in Montana. Now, they still stocked reservoirs and mountain lakes, but they started to not stock. It was revolutionary in the United States. But Montana then changed its brand and from being a place to catch a lot of fish, now it's a place to catch a lot of wild fish. And that was the beginning of wild fish management. Another thing that was going on in eastern Montana, eastern Montana kind of gets forgotten when you talk about Montana fisheries. Eastern Montana, it's kind of like North Dakota. There's a lot going on there. But no one really knew what was there until the 19, early 1980s when biologists started to do the first prairie stream surveys. So they went out with these little seines, and they're looking at, oh my gosh, can you believe the fish in here? The darters, and the shiners, and the sculpin, and the little sunfish, and all kinds of cool fish. I mean, the Iowa darter, it's about this big. It's a relative to the sauger and the, and the walleye, and it's beautifully colored, and they zip around. They call it darters because they zip around in underwater. And you know, you can't catch them. Well, some people could try, but you catch them this big. Some people actually do fish for fish that small, but they're beautiful little gems and they're in those rivers of eastern Montana. 80 plus species of fish live in eastern Montana. People didn't know that before. And so it's an awakening for the citizens of eastern Montana to value their own environment and their own aquatic ecosystems. Another big issue in eastern Montana, Fort Peck Reservoir. It was built in the 1930s. It created one of the biggest recreational fisheries in the West, 
Fort Peck Reservoir is a fantastic place for walleye, smallmouth bass. But what it did, it did is it blocked the migration routes of pallid sturgeon. And so when it was built in the 30s, those pallid sturgeon, which for millions of years, millions of years, had been moving upstream to spawn. Suddenly they can't move anymore and their population started to decline. Today, there's a hundred wild pallid sturgeon left in the Missouri and Yellowstone River. It's the most endangered fish in the entire United States. And so the biologists could see what was going on and they started to do studies. They started to figure out what was going on with the pallid sturgeon, not only on the below um, Fort Peck Dam, which is shown there, but Intake Dam, which is on the Yellowstone River, which is just a little bit downstream from Sydney. It's almost in North Dakota. Intake Dam, which is a low head dam. It's a diversion dam. It's not a big dam like that. It's only about that tall. But it, it, it um, diverts water into a massive irrigation system that irrigates 11,000 square miles, economically vital, but at the same time blocking the, the, the uh, upstream migration of pallid sturgeon. So this is going on too. People are starting to value, value native fish. They're starting to say, what about the native fish? And even more important, what if we lose these fish on our watch? What a tragedy that, that would be if our grandkids said, hey, you let pallid sturgeon disappear? How did you do that? So during the time leading up to today, but in the past four plus decades, the popularity of Montana and its fisheries grew dramatically. And you, many of you maybe have been here through that time and have watched the increase in tourism through, that, through these decades and, and the impacts that that has on our resources and how we're able to manage them. And that's resulted from successful ad campaigns, outdoor writers, um, raving about the opportunities to come use our uh, beautiful resources and diverse resources. A river runs um, through it. Especially a river runs through it. I saw some pictures of the McLeans <laughs> out there, um, that book, and then later the movie that really popularized fly fishing and the lifestyle that goes along with it. So all of that really culminated in boom, booming our, our tourism industry and the visitors that come here to, uh, to share in these resources we have. But but with that increase comes the potential for threats of aquatic invasive species, um, fish, plants, um, and fish pathogens or diseases that can come in on uh, recreational equipment, anything used that in the water. So uh, unsuspecting tourists and, and residents alike that have traveled out of state can um, unwittingly come back and introduce threats to our uh, native resources and what we have here and, and some of that I'm, I know you've seen played out recently. And so using, and the fisheries division response through this time has been to try to learn more about what we have and how these threats might um, interact and, and potentially <coughs> damage our shared resources. And so some of those ways that uh, we've, and I'll say we is the royal we now, but um, we've done that is using some of the technologies that have advanced so quickly throughout the past four decades, the past two decades, really. Um, there's been some dramatic increases in technology that we're able to use. Um, some things like these radio telemetry transmitters that we can implant in fish to learn where they go after we release them. We've learned about important spawning habitat and rearing uh, areas or movement patterns of native fish or, or any fish that we're interested in. Um, and that's been really valuable to help protect important areas. Um, Electrofishing has come a long way since its beginnings, but we still use that quite a bit today to just get our hands on fish and learn about them, um, answer some basic questions that are still out there. Um, taking little pieces of fish fin and extracting the DNA out of them has told us a lot, and conservation genetics as a field has changed rapidly and continues to today, and that can tell us, for example, how important stream connectivity is to different fish and uh, sustaining their populations. And more recently, you can test the water that fish live in to determine what species are present or if uh, a restoration action has been effective. And that's called environmental or eDNA. So there are, are many different tools that we have at our disposal in recent decades to help learn more and hopefully serve these resources and, and understand how these potential invaders are interacting, uh, aquatic invasive species. And throughout this same time, hatcheries have been 
um, shifting in some, some aspects their role. So we still have the hatcheries producing fish to stock for, um, for angling opportunities, but there's also been some time spent learning how to better raise native species for conservation efforts, like Arctic grayling. And so that's been, um, and, and research capacity as well. And so that's grown through the years to help mitigate some of the um, setbacks we may see with invasives. Now, fish pathogens like whirling disease unfortunately still made their way into Montana. And many of you maybe saw headlines, headlines in the 90s for when that first hit the Madison River and devastated the trout populations there. And whether at the time the thought was we may not rebound, but fortunately that did happen. And although it still exists in the Madison at low levels and the rainbow trout population rebounded, um, that occurred despite efforts since the 60s to prevent, for example, a ban on, on bringing infected fish into the state. And the beginnings of the fish health program in the state um, came long before whirling disease were, was detected. But um, fortunately, we have seem to have dodged a bullet there. But the, the fish health... Um, Fish health folks at FWP continue to monitor streams and rivers and lakes for different diseases that pose threats to not just hatchery stocks but wild populations. And I know you um, that PKD outbreak in the Yellowstone is um, pretty fresh in everyone's mind. So, of course, I can't promise I'll have the answer, but ah. So a lot of times that is the case, um, and that stressors like warmer temperatures, um, angling, that's why we'll have sometimes angling closures when it's warmer, it can compound on fish and make them more susceptible to diseases that may be present um, for a long time. A lot of them are. I mean, uh, I, I don't know if whirling disease made its way here when that happened or the, the origination. Um, maybe Larry knows here. And for some reason, it just didn't seem to affect that, that rainbow population. Yeah. So if you guys, are, the rest of you are wondering why there's just some guy <laughs> who just seemed to wander in, a homeless person who seemed to know all this stuff about fisheries. This is Larry Peterman. He used to be the fisheries chief of 
FWP, so that's why we, we planted him in the audience in case <laughs> there are any questions we didn't know, because there were yeah. sure to be some. Don't envy that. <laughs> So in addition to disease, to disease concerns like whirling disease and PKD and others, um, the threats posed by invasive plants and animals pose unique challenges in Montana with such a vast landscape and diverse recreational opportunities and relatively sparse population. And um, as I said, uh, invaders can make their way into the state through a variety of pathways, but largely it's on these water-based recreational equipment. And um, so the mantra for clean, drain, dry largely came out of FWP's efforts through its Aquatic Invasive Species, or AIS, program, and others like-minded to help educate lawmakers, business owners, and fishing groups, and community members on the impacts, the potential impacts of invaders that haven't made their way here um, to our resources so that we can hopefully either prevent the spread or entry into the state. And one of the outcomes of these efforts was some legislation in 2009 known as the Aquatic Invasive Species Act, which set up some regulations to help protect our resources from invaders. So that includes mandatory stopping at watercraft inspection stations, and if you're carrying any kind of water-based recreational equipment, and a ban on importing any kind of AIS into Montana or transporting within Montana, as well as making it illegal to move live fish or uh, invertebrates and plants from one water body to another in the state without FWP authorization. So some of these um, regulations were in place trying to prevent uh, infestations from happening. However, unfortunately, as um, you have observed in recent detection of mussel larvae or villagers as they're known, and Canyon Ferry and uh, Tiber Reservoirs, that there can be uh, pretty dramatic and rapid impacts to uh, our, our resources just from a preventative standpoint. Now we've dra dramatically expanded our monitoring of watercraft throughout the state in response to that to try to prevent the spread from continuing. And so that kind of leads us into where we are today in the future. So, we, um, so we're going to wrap up here. Um, we talked about in the beginning how fisheries management doesn't just exist in a vacuum, that it's a reflection in large part uh, of the values that Montanans hold. And whatever those values are, that's like so many public agencies, I guess all public agencies, we, we, we move with that tide. And so, so what's, what's the future going to be? What are Montanans' values? values? Well, at this point, it's, fisheries management is harder than ever because Montanans, Montanans value everything, okay? They, they value economic development. Of course they do. They value mining and logging and agriculture and ranching. But increasingly, they value clean water and beautiful view sheds and economically valuable and recreationally benef beneficial fisheries populations. And so how do you balance that? Montanans increasingly, increasingly value native fish species, West Slope cutthroat trout, bull trout, pallid sturgeon. But it's not like they're giving up on rainbow trout and walleye. They want them both. They want the natives and the non-natives. And so Montanans want to have their cake and eat it too. Of course, we all do. And so one of the challenges for people like Amber, I'm not doing that. I'm in an office just writing about this stuff. Amber's got to go out and figure out how to strike that balance and figure out how to do management that allows Montana to have everything it, wa it wants. In addition to factoring in things like that there's more water users than there ever have been before. Not just anglers, but kayakers and inner tubers and other people who want to enjoy Montana's environment, but they just don't care to fish to do it. And then you throw in climate change, something we can't in Montana do anything about. But we have to factor it in when we do fisheries management. For example, the movement of smallmouth bass slowly upstream on the Yellowstone River. Now all the way up to as far as Reed's Point, we have an established population there. How's that going to affect the trout population there? So it's just another thing that fisheries biologists have to factor in when they're figuring out how to strike this delicate balance 
to give Montanans everything they want. That's the bad news, or the challenging news. So despite all the bad things that Tom was just sharing with you and trying to bring you down, um, the balancing act that, that biologists and managers uh, in fisheries face in Montana is um, it's a tough one, but it's looking into the future, we're confident because we know we exist because of the will of Montanans. And the work that we do isn't possible without your support. And not just support, but collaboration, whether that's with local communities, lawmakers, businesses, fishing groups, the diverse range of people that make up Montana um, are important to things like securing conservation easements that help uh, preserve fish habitat and fishing access, which is a big one now, fishing access sites across the state and maintaining them and improving them. And uh, maintaining stream flows for fish, balancing that with the needs of irrigation and water supply for communities, and to provide effective legislation that helps conserve our resources. But also to make sure we educate our future leaders and community members about the diverse resources that we all share and that we hope to have into the future. And so, although much has changed since people were using dynamite and poison to harvest fish, a lot of what's remained the same is this um, underscore of value that we all place on these um, pristine and unique resources that we have in Montana that are really unlike uh, anywhere else. And we all hope to work together to conserve that for now and into the future. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, yeah. <laughs> And we'd be, we'd be sure happy to, um, to entertain any questions.